the Battle of Bretton Woods, John Maynard Keynes, Henry Dexter White, and the Making of a New World Order tells the story of the intertwining lives and events surrounding that historic conference. In a book the Financial Times calls a triumph of economic and diplomatic history, Ben challenges the misconception that the conference was an amiable collaboration. He reveals that President Franklin Roosevelt's Treasury had an ambitious geopolitical agenda that sought to use the conference as a means to eliminate Great Britain as a rival. Steele also offers a portrait of the complex and controversial White, revealing the motives behind his clandestine communications with Soviet intelligence officials, to whom he was arguably to be much more important than the famous early Cold War spy, Alger Hess. Everything is here, political chicanery, bureaucratic skullduggery, espionage, hard economic detail, and the acid humor of men making history under pressure, wrote Tony Barber, reviewer for the FT. And that's not the only glowing review that Ben has received for this work. The New York Times said it should become the gold standard on its topic. The Wall Street Journal called it a superb history, and Mr. Steele a talented storyteller. Tom Keene of Bloomberg Radio called it the publishing event of the season. John Tammy at Forbes thinks it's what President Obama should take to the vineyard this summer for his reading. Even Paul Volcker weighed in. This is a fascinating study of monetary affairs and the politics of international finance, all tied up in the history of the Bretton Woods system and its ultimate demise. The book is full of lessons that are relevant today in a world that still resists international monetary reform. I'm pleased to say that, uh, that I'm halfway through the book, which is good news for all of you, so I won't spoil the ending. That's a joke in my attempt at one. Please join me in welcoming Ben Steele and Marshall Sonnenschein. I don't want to ruin lunch, but since David said he's only halfway through the book, I always feel the need to tell everybody the ending. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I just am going to do this, and you won't like me afterwards, but I am going to tell you that in the long run, Keynes died. So now you know. Um, well, Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. Exactly. That was exactly. Um, normally, in my classes at Columbia, I call on the students. I, I don't think it's fair to do that at a conference lunch. And I'm going to make the assumption that some of you are not yet halfway through the book, but that uh, those of you that are not will be buying the book at the table outside. Um, and then we can reconvene in a week, and we'll, ha we'll have the, uh, the Socratic dialogue, and I'll call on you. But I think for this session, I'm, I'm supposed to call on you, Ben, um, which is a pleasure. Uh, I told Ben, as we were gearing up for this discussion, uh, that before I was a banker, I was once a history major, and I actually wasn't sure what his doctorate was in, and I wanted to know whether it was actually in history, and he corrected me and said, no, his doctorate is in economics. And I said to him, and I want to say this right up front, uh, this book makes the dismal profession seem actually rather colorful, um, because these are larger-than-life personalities. John Maynard Keynes uh, was, this, as Ben says, I think it's a good description, the very first celebrity economist. He was a celebrity at that time. Uh, and it was probably pulling out all the stops at the British government racking up debts to the United States on the eve of this uh, conference in 1944, tried serving up a celebrity, maybe in hopes that that would change the dynamic at the conference. Uh, the lesser known of the two characters in Ben's book, of course, is Harry Dexter White, who was a kind of special assistant, not really a properly titled person, as you tell the story, to uh, Secretary of Treasury Morgenthau. So these are larger than uh, life figures, which we're going to hear about in a moment. But Ben, maybe uh, in order to give this uh, audience, which, as I said, maybe has not yet read the first half of the book, to maybe to give them some context, we all remember Bretton Woods from whatever history classes we've taken, and we know that it is one of the watershed events in modern financial history. But put it in a little bit of context, the 1944 summer in New Hampshire up at this, uh, not really a cabin, it was a big resort, Cute. Uh, uh, not really a Catskills type resort either, but a very special place. Um, what was this about, and how did it fit within a broader context of what was happening in financial life in mid-century? The Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 is actually the most important international gathering since the Paris Peace Talks in 1919. And in fact, FDR very much had the Paris Peace Talks in mind when he um, uh, initiated Bretton Woods. That is, he was absolutely determined to make sure that it wouldn't fail, 
in the way um, Paris 1919 did. He was very conscious of the fact that Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations died in the Republican um, uh, Senate. He wasn't going to make the same mistake. And in fact, the main reason that Bretton Woods, New Hampshire was chosen was because it uh, had a Republican uh, senator who was facing a very tough primary battle in the fall. Um, Charles Toby, who was known as being an isolationist and an opponent of international organizations, and FDR felt if he gave him the conference, he might not only convert him, but could use him to win around some other reluctant Republicans, and in fact, that's um, e exactly what happened. The conference takes place over three weeks in July of 1944. It starts only three weeks after the D-Day landings at Normandy. So there's a real sense of sort of anxious optimism in the air that perhaps the beginning of the end of the war has arrived, so that the discussions at Bretton Woods could hold real consequence for the world. Um, there are 44 allied nations represented, uh, over 700 um, delegates. FDR wanted to use the conference to send a political message to the enemy Axis powers that it was the United States and its allies that had the compelling post-war vision. He felt that could actually serve to bring the war to an earlier conclusion. The conference details itself, however, were entirely scripted by FDR's treasury. And although FDR had no interest in international monetary affairs, certainly not the details of them, um, his um, treasury team, in particular, Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau and his right-hand man, I would argue his brain, he didn't have a particularly acute one, um, Harry Dexter White. Um, these men were really economic determinists. They had a very specific view of how we'd come to these unfortunate circumstances of a Second World War in just a quarter century. They believed it was the currency wars of the early 1930s um, kicked off by Britain leaving the gold standard in 1931, or I should say the gold exchange standard of 1931, that gave rise to the uh, international trade wars that spread the Great Depression globally and created the environment of misery and anger that paved the path for Hitler and Mussolini to pursue their wars of uh, aggression. Um, so this was um, a, an event that held great geopolitical significance for the United States. So I just want to pause for a moment on the setting, because I, I, in the first 50 pages, you, you do a remarkable job bringing us to essentially summer camp in New Hampshire. Um, 44 nations represented 700 people for three weeks in July in New Hampshire at a big old inn, uh, a somewhat famous inn in that, uh, in, in that time. Uh, and they're going to spend three weeks in the woods. These are finance ministers, central bankers, no doubt lawyers, uh, a, a fairly eclectic group of people from around the world, while the world is at war, to discuss the problems of financing the war and the problems of the currency wars that took place before the actual World War II. I have this right, right? That's right. I mean, it was, it was geared towards the post-war. Right, world. Yes. Okay, so um, they get together, and this is the first time they're getting together. So unlike G G7 or G8 or G20 meetings, which have a protocol and a rhythm, and they're kind of scripted and everybody knows what's going to happen before it happens, there was no template for this meeting, was there? There was a template within the mind of one man, Harry Dexter White, who scripted it down to the level of a kabuki play. Uh, I should emphasize that although Bretton Woods is often seen as this sort of kumbaya moment where the world comes together to produce a new rational geoeconomic uh, architecture, it was anything of the sort. Um, the, 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 the reason why 43 other nations came to Bretton Woods was to hear what the United States planned to do about a problem which from their perspective the United States had created. Um, in the 1940s, the only way you could trade other than through barter was with dollars and gold. And the United States controlled 80% of the world's monetary gold stock at the time. So they were there to find out what the United States was going to do about the problem. Well, I want to come back to the agenda. Because you said that there uh, was no template other than what was in the mind of one Harry Dexter White. Now, everybody here is familiar with the name John Maynard Keynes, but only some of us, presumably, have 
uh, bumped into the name Harry Dexter White. It's not exactly on the tip of everybody's tongue in normal vernacular, even among people educated about American history. Uh, tell us about Harry Dexter White. Uh, where did he come from? How did he get into this gig? And what was in his head as the 700 people were convening for three weeks together in the woods? Uh, Harry Dexter White is perhaps um, one of the most fascinating American political figures of the 20th century that nobody knows anything about. Um, he's sort of the polar opposite of Keynes in terms of his background and temperament. He's born in 1892, eight years after Keynes. He's the youngest of seven children of Lithuanian Jewish immigrants. His father is a hardware peddler. Um, White actually leaves college in his first attempt at an undergraduate degree in order to go back into the family hardware business. His parents actually die when he's very young, his mother when he's nine, his father when he's um, 16. He comes into his own, as it were, re relatively late in life. Um, he finishes his doctorate at, at Harvard uh, in economics at the age of um, uh, almost 40. Uh, but he's unable to get tenure there. And he moves to a small college in uh, Wisconsin, uh, Appleton College, where he's terribly unhappy. Um, he's thinking about what to do next. And he sends a letter to his former advisor at Harvard, uh, Frank Tausig, saying that um, he's learning Russian uh, and wants to get a scholarship to go to Moscow to study economic planning. But before he can make good on his uh, plan, he receives a letter from uh, University of Chicago economist Jacob Viner, who is working temporarily for the US Treasury, to come to Washington to work for a few months on a study of um, US banking and monetary institutions. And to make a long story short, he simply makes himself indispensable over the course of 12 years um, to incoming Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau. Morgenthau is 43 years old when he's appointed by FDR in 1943. He's an old friend of FDR's from uh, Hyde Park, New York. He knows nothing about um, ec economics. He refers to himself as an apple farmer, although he's very much a gentleman uh, apple farmer. And Harry Dexter White, although he was not a, a brilliant technical economist, was a man who had a, a, a tremendous knack for translating ideas into policy, and he was also ruthless and very ambitious. As early as 1936, um, you find um, memos in his archive indicating that the man, when he's barely more than a bureaucratic temp at the Treasury, is planning an international conference uh, at which um, he, Harry Dexter White, is going to best the British. Um, he says in 1936 in a memo, uh, the more sterling countries there are in the world, the more countries that use the pound sterling or whose currencies are linked to sterling, the stronger will be Britain's position around the table when an international conference takes place. This is eight years before Bretton Woods, so he's already planning this conference. Fast forward to Bretton Woods and he leaves absolutely nothing to chance. So let me get this straight. We're in the middle of World War II, not the middle, we're in the later stages of World War II, 1944, it's the summer. 44 nations, 700 representatives convene in New Hampshire uh, for a conference that has no historical precedent. So we don't know, this is not, there's no uh, uh, rules of order or rules of procedure. We don't know quite how this is going to shake out. They all got on a boat or a plane, however they got to New Hampshire. And only one guy has kind of cleverly masterminded this conference and scripted it. And he's a guy who comes from Boston, from Lithuanian Jewish immigrants, got his doctorate at Harvard late in life, and was teaching economics at a college no one had really ever heard of. And he has no real title in the Treasury Department, am I right? He's actually paid for most of his career out of the profits of the Exchange Stabilization Fund. So it's sort of a made up gig. <laughs> he called himself an assistant to the Treasury sec uh, Secretary, which he probably cleverly created an, an, an ellipse around which some people thought he meant he was the Assistant Treasury Secretary, but he wasn't Well, Henry really Morgenthau planned it that way. Um, he wanted to acknowledge White's contributions, but at, at the same time keep him on a very, very long leash. Okay, so um, in one corner is Harry Dexter White, this little known figure with this um, curious background and the lack of any real title from the American establishment other than professor at this college that no one had heard of, and arrives from London from the other side, the most celebrated, most titled Lord Keynes of Oxford, 
Cambridge. Cambridge, excuse me, and his parents as well of the faculty of Cambridge. Lord Keynes is essentially British intellectual aristocracy. I don't think they had a lot of money, I don't mean it in that sense, but they were members of the establishment, if ever there were such a thing, in the most uh, revered English way, they were smart. And to make matters even more interesting, John Maynard Keynes was erudite. He was a man with a silver tongue who could turn a phrase. He was a debater. He was a uh, writer. He hung with the Bloomsbury crowd. He was even literary in his sensibilities. What were the British trying to achieve by sending John Maynard Keynes into the woods with Harry Dexter White and 700 other attendees? The British were going bankrupt during World War II. Um, and they desperately needed American financial assistance to get through the war. But the Americans were absolutely determined not to give Britain more assistance than it needed to stay in the war. The Americans were believed, this is FDR's treasury specifically, that the British were, were um, uh, the natural geopolitical and economic rival of the United States. And that after the war was completed, we were essentially going back to go back to the way the world was supposed to be, basically the late 19th century. So they were determined to use the opportunity of Britain's impending bankruptcy um, to uh, force a reordering of the global order. Why did the British send Keynes? Because every other uh, emissary of the um, British establishment, Lord Halifax, Lord Lothian, had failed to um, get the uh, uh, Americans to provide what they considered to be the necessary assistance on reasonable terms. There's a nice little piece of British doggerel from the period that captures the way the British thought of themselves in the world. It said, uh, in Washington, Lord Halifax once whispered to Lord Keynes, it's true they have the money bags, but we have all the brains. So Keynes has all the brains, and Dexter is a technocrat, if ever there was. And if I understand the setting correctly, the British are going broke on World War II. They are fighting a war on multiple fronts. Their far-flung empire, once an asset to Great Britain financially, had by 1944 begun to become, if it hadn't already in fact become, a liability. That's right. They were running out of money. And they may have had all the brains, but we on this side had all the money. And we were bankrolling them through the Lend-Lease program which was also being discussed even during the uh, conference itself. Uh, we were then the opposite of what we are today. We're the, uh, one of the larger debtor nations today, the United States, but at that moment we were the larger creditor nation. And Britain, of course, was a great debtor nation because we were funding them. So they're running out of money, but they have a celebrity economist uh, from the aristocracy of their society at their helm at this conference. And we're just coming into our own. We're, we've arrived into the war first as a result of Pearl Harbor three years earlier, but now on the shores of Normandy. And we're going to rescue Britain militarily and economically. And however erudite, if I understand the setting correctly, however erudite is Lord Keynes, um, White has all the money. For two years in the run up to Bretton Woods, um, uh, White and Keynes spar, as it were, about um, uh, what the um, content of Bretton Woods will be. Uh, Keynes, for example, want to create a, create a new international currency, which you would call Bancor, which would rival the US dollar. Bancor, B-A-N-C-O-R. B-A-N-C-O-R. Uh, sort of like the digital thing, just something that you would sort of make up and it would... Uh, pretty much, and he wanted this stuff to be um, created according to um, a, a formula that would basically be determined by the contribution of, of one's country to world trade. This was very convenient to Britain, which traded a lot, but actually had no gold. Right. Um, Harry Dexter White would have none of it. He was a staunch monetary nationalist, and he was determined that this U.S. Ins this U.S. dominated institution would preside over a dollar-based system. Uh, uh, one point in uh, uh, low point in their relations in October of 1943. Keynes gets fed up with White, takes a version of the White plan that he's uh, presented with, throws it on the ground and yells, this is intolerable, it is yet another Talmud. Uh, 
Keynes is very <laughs> conscious of the fact that White is Jewish, his primary deputies are Jewish, Henry Morgenthau himself is Jewish. This would come out in his moments of frustration to which White replies, uh, we will try to produce something which your highness can understand. So <laughs> at the conference itself, White relegates Keynes to the commission responsible for creating the World Bank, which the Americans care nothing about just to keep him away from the main event, which is creating the IMF and making sure that it, it um, presides over a dollar-based system. And he uses some remarkable ruses at Bretton Woods to push it through. If I can just emphasize uh, one, one key point here is that Bretton Woods was part of a Faustian bargain that Britain uh, uh, agreed with the United States to get through the war. It had three elements. Um, the US would provide Britain with very short-term financial assistance, loans, not grants, um, to get through the war, lend-lease aid in a uh, post-war transitional loan in return. But the British thought we would never demand repayment. We would just give them money. Uh, the British actually paid back their debts in 2006. It took them that long. Yeah. Right. Uh, under Prime Minister Tony Blair, they made their last repayment. Right. Um, they, the British agreed to, uh, were forced to agree to three, three things. First, to end imperial trade preference. This was the arrangement by which Britain gave itself privileged uh, access to the markets of its colonies and dominions. Second, Brit Britain would make the pound sterling fully convertible again into US dollars at a fixed exchange rate by a fixed date it, that turned out to be July 15th, 1947, a day that will live in infamy uh, from Britain's perspective because that was basically the day when they were bankrupted. Um, they had very little dollars in gold and couldn't afford to make the pound um, uh, convertible. And uh, finally, Britain would agree um, to the creation of a new international monetary architecture with the US dollar. Uh, as the global unit of account. And why did they do it? Well, as British economist and delegate Blino Robbins put it at Bretton Woods, quote unquote, we needed the cash. Well, if you really understand Bretton Woods as you've explained it, Ben, isn't what happened here, tell me whether this is a fair summary, that Bretton Woods was the last gasp of Britain's attempt to live in a world that was crumbling beneath its feet. And I don't just mean the, the military world of World War II, which uh, the counterfactualists among us would probably say uh, uh, the European allies might well have lost without America's support. But I mean something much broader, which was the British Empire. That in some ways, this might have been the last act of the American Revolution, because everything that Keynes was arguing was how things should be. Mm -hmm. We should continue to have imperial preference. After all, we're British. We should continue to have the Sterling be the central actor on the global financial scene. After all, we're British. Uh, uh, never mind that we're going bankrupt. We're British, and we have all the brains, as you said. And White, on his side, was not talking about the way things were or the way things should be if you're British. He was talking about the way things are, which is you guys need us to bail you out, and you are going to pay us back, and we're going to write the checks, and we're going to write the rules. Isn't that what was really going on here? Pretty much. Uh, White had a, a very um, a broad political agenda. Um, he not only wanted to force liquidation of the British Empire to eliminate Britain as a geopolitical rival, but he had a very specific post-war vision. He wanted the U.S. to go forward in a, a permanent peacetime collaboration with the new rising power, European power, on the global stage that was the, the Soviet Union. Now, we're going to come to the Soviets and the fact that Harry Dexter White was also a part-time Moonlighter spy, which we need, to, we, we need to deal with also. But before we get there, I think the tangible outcomes, Ben, and tell me how, uh, how correct this is as a synthesis, but the tangible outcomes of the Bretton Woods Conference itself, other than whatever else fun people had in the woods of New Hampshire, uh, were the IMF and the World Bank and the creation of, for the first official time, although I think it was unofficially already happening, the dollar as the reserve currency of this planet. Yes. That is to say, we would take the old gold standard, and this was really cleverly, cleverly crafted by Harry Dexter White and sort of bamboozled by the Brits and everybody else, but we would take the old gold standard and basically say, now we are going to live with a dollar standard, but don't worry, the dollar will still be tied to gold, but you all will revolve around the dollar. We kind of made the dollar the center of the universe. Isn't that That's correct. kind of? That's absolutely correct. Um, White had absolutely no intention of allowing um, a gold flows to influence the conduct of U.S. monetary policy, but he was determined to exploit the fact that the U.S. controlled 
such a huge proportion of the world's monetary gold stock to um, make the dollar, this is in the IMF's articles of agreement, the only currency surrogate for gold. It was essentially declared to be the equivalent of gold. Now, the Soviets re readily went along with this. Um, they, they didn't want to pony up their share. You tell that story that they wanted a billion two or whatever it was of, of the share of the, of, of the IMF fund, and they only wanted to pay 800 or 900 million dollars for that, and they ultimately paid the right amount. Uh, but the Soviets went along with this. The Soviets went along with it uh, at Bretton Woods because they were only interested in two things. One is to get um, uh, concessionary loans from the United States, which Stalin knew he could eventually repudiate at his convenience. Um, second, although um, uh, the international monetary system as such had no meaning to the Soviets because all their um, uh, tra international trade was state controlled. They liked the idea of a gold based international monetary system because the Soviets had a lot of gold, at least buried under the ground, and this would help boost the global value of their gold stocks. I should emphasize that to Harry Dexter White's deep, grave disappointment, the Soviets never ratified the IMF Articles of Agreement because um, uh, no loans from the United States, despite the efforts of Harry Dexter White, were forthcoming. Now, before we open it up to a couple of quick questions, we have to deal with the fact that while the Soviets were among the 44 nations present at the formation of the IMF, the World Bank, and the dollar as the de facto reserve currency of the New World Order. Harry Dexter White himself had a peculiar fascination with the Soviet Union, and by all accounts, an unhealthy one. That is to say, as you, I think, said earlier today to me and to some of our guests, you felt that he was a moonlighter as a spy. There's no getting around the fact that he was a spy, he wasn't a spy in the most uh, mercenary sense. He didn't feel that he was giving away any important information, and he probably wasn't. But he was certainly giving away information he shouldn't have been given away. And he was ultimately hauled in front of the House uh, Un-American Affairs Committee, or whatever that thing was called. Although, and he was denied his uh, expected role as the first executive director of the IMF. He was merely permitted by then to be a board member. He had shot him his own political career over this some, some years later. But for the moment, he is presiding over this conference. He is throwing Britain under the bus in some ways, economically. And he is cutting side deals and talking a little bit behind the scenes too much to the Soviets. Am I right? Uh, he did actually uh, perform some uh, very heroic acts for the Soviets. Um, he was an American delegate at the San Francisco conference the following spring in 1945 to create the United Nations, where he was leaking very valuable uh, American negotiating positions to the Soviets, such as the bottom line that the Americans, if they had to, would cede a veto to the Soviets within the UN Security Council. That was information that was fed to them by Harry Dexter White. White was responsible in 1944 for delivering to the Soviets um, duplicates of the currency plates that the Americans were going to use to produce an occupation currency for Germany. The Soviets used these plates to produce massive amounts of currency, uh, 78 billion occupation marks, over eight times what we printed up. They cashed that um, money in in uh, Washington at the fixed exchange rate by, uh, set by Harry Dexter White, rating the US Treasury for, in current dollars, about four and a half to six billion dollars. So he did perform rather heroic acts for the Soviets. Um, in terms of the position he took at Bretton Woods, there was, I should emphasize, there was no um, uh, remnant of Soviet monetary thinking um, uh, in the IMF Articles agreement, of Agreement because there was no Soviet monetary thinking. But there was, is a tangible legacy of uh, White's activities that lives on um, in the IMF today. In uh, January of 1946, President Truman nominates Harry Dexter White to be the first U.S. Executive Director of the IMF and is going to nominate him to be the first Managing Director, the head of the IMF. When FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover gets wind of this, though, he prefer, prepares a very long memorandum for Truman saying, essentially, don't even think of it. I can prove that the man is a Soviet spy. Now, Truman doesn't trust Hoover, but he knows he has an enormous political problem on his hands and uh, to cover it up, 
He knows he can't put another American over Harry Dexter White because that's going to raise, raise questions about why the architect of the fund is being passed over. So the um, Truman administration concocts a new narrative that they take to the British, wherein the US decides that after all, uh, they decided that they want the World Bank top post rather than the IMF top post, and it would be rude of us to take both institutions. Now, this is uncharacteristically fair-minded of the administration, which insisted that both <laughs> institutions be domiciled in Washington. So this is the reason why, to this day, a European heads the IMF and not an American. Well, it, there's many, many, many tales and subplots and intrigues to be told that we don't have time for today because uh, I, I see we've already uh, consumed our time. It's fascinating. If somebody had told me before I read this book that what Bretton Woods really was was 44 nations, 700 people getting together in the woods of New Hampshire with the British running out of money and trying to articulate through a celebrity economist why they should remain the center of the world. And the United States, through a little known economist teaching in a college no one, no one had ever heard of with no proper title in the Treasury Department, scripting everything such that the dollar would become the center, the new IMF and World Bank would be constructed and headquartered in Washington, while he all along was talking inappropriately with Soviets, which he was, even though he was, I would have said that's fiction, that's not reality, and yet you, Ben, have turned it into history because it wasn't fiction. And you told it with your own erudition. So I, I can't tell you how much fun it was to read this book. I, I think everybody really should. If you're in the financial world, we have currency war today. It's a very different type. And we're on the opposite side of a lot of the positions that we took back then. And as you correctly point out, where you stand on most currency issues has a lot to do with where you sit. Uh, and so uh, right now, we would like the Chinese to behave differently. And um, we, would like to, we would like to rewrite the rules a little bit this time. Uh, do we have time for one or two quick questions, as long as we've put all this to you? Or, sh or very quick. We have one or two quick for Ben. Yeah. The yen has dropped to about 100. What's the effect of Japanese manipulation of the yen, which appears to be with the consent of other countries? Yeah, um, the Japanese have learned one very important lesson over the course of the past few months. That is, if you're going to depreciate your currency, do not talk about it. <laughs> um, so they're going forward with Abe economics, Abenomics, uh, yes. full steam ahead, but they've learned never, ever to talk about depreciating one's, um, uh, one's currency. Um, over the course of the past a few months, I've read pers pers um, <laughs> um, uh, perfectly rational, sober economic commentators arguing that the dollar is overvalued, that the euro is overvalued, that the yen is overvalued, that the pound sterling is overvalued. Martin Wolf jumped in on, on that part of the debate recently. Well, those four currencies alone represent over uh, half the global economy. They can't possibly all be overvalued. But the point is, is, is that if all those um, countries believe that their currency is overvalued and that they need to boost net exports through having a cheaper currency, at, at least one, probably more of them, uh, are going to be disappointed. And this is where things get worried. Uh, because if they're disappointed trying to use the currency to produce higher net exports, then they're going to start taking more overt uh, protectionist um, trade measures. And that's essentially an unfurling of the 1930s again. And that's where I believe things get worried. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have consumed our time. This is one hell of a read. Um, so I hope everybody will read it. And in the meantime, for me to be able to interview Ben, uh, an economist, a celebrity economist in New York, I might add, uh, for the M&A advisors. Just a sheer pleasure. So I thank you all very, very much. Thank you.